Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the Atlanta Council. Uh, we're, uh, I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding director of the Global Energy Center here, and we're very pleased uh, to host you uh, here today for what I think will be a very timely discussion uh, on the future of nuclear energy in China uh, and to, uh, to some extent, nuclear energy overall. Uh, this, uh, today's program relates to our climate change series. Nuclear energy does relate to climate change. Uh, and also alternative technologies because we'll be talking a lot about small module reactors. Uh, <clears throat> today, more than ever, well, you all know, countries across the world are faced with a number of challenging trade-offs when determining their energy future. Uh, in the wake of sweeping changes to patterns of global energy consumption, countries, particularly in the developing world, must find an energy mix that enables them to sustain economic development while reining in carbon, carbon emissions. And no country looms larger at the intersection of energy and climate than China. I think it's apropos that the president of China was here just recently. Uh, China's the world's top energy consumer and second largest economy and has had to account for a soaring energy demand uh, in recent years. And the decisions that will be made today in China will impact the country's energy mix for decades to come. And while energy sources like coal and solar have generally garnered more attention, uh, nuclear energy will play a major, major part uh, in China's energy future. Today, we're, I think, very lucky to have convened uh, an excellent panel to assess nuclear energy's future role from technical, geopolitical, and commercial perspectives. We'll be starting with Dr. Joe Lassiter, who's a senior fellow and the Senator John Hines Professor of Management Practice and Environmental Management at the Harvard Business School. So he'll kick off today's discussion with a uh, brief presentation uh, relating to a case study uh, that he's done on uh, small, small module reactors and particularly the relationship with China. And his presentation will be followed by remarks, he, I'm, many of you know him, John Elkind, uh, the, where are you John, there you are, the Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs who will frame the discussion of nuclear energy in the uh, broader context of energy and climate outcomes from uh, President uh, Xi Jinping's visit uh, last week. Uh, John Hopkins, uh, over here, is the chairman and CEO of New Scale Power, which is a small modular nuclear reactor development company. Uh, they're actually, I think it's uh, public. They're 96% owned uh, by the Floor Corporation, and he's going to discuss how he sees prospects uh, for small modular technologies. And finally, Ambassador Vashlav Bartushka, who is, I've known for many years and is the Czech ambassador at large uh, for energy security, and you may wonder why, if we're talking mostly about China, do we have the, do we have the Czech ambassador at large for energy security here with us, other than that I like him a lot. Uh, <coughs> but uh, he's had a little bit, Vashlov has had a lot of experience uh, uh, looking into SMRs and can talk about it uh, in a broader uh, nuclear context and uh, lay out some of the main considerations uh, for governments as how they, um, will how they will look at these kinds of issues. Uh, as uh, one last housekeeping note, I would encourage you all to join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag ACEnergy. And uh, without further uh, ado, I've talked long enough. Uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Joe. Thanks, Dick. Appreciate it. Let me see if I can run the, uh, the clicker here. I think I can. There should be hard copies of these slides for everybody, and I bet you the panel doesn't have hard copies, so if Bruce has got any spare hard copies, give them to him. Uh, what am I worried about? Uh, I'm worried that we cannot change uh, the fate of the climate fast enough, uh, and that unless we do, 
uh, we will get into an irreversible situation where we're no longer in control of our fate. Uh, I got this cartoon, it's now seven years old, uh, and it, it, it's a commentary on the difficulty of reaching international agreement here. You see it's 2040, people have finally got an agreement, and the sea has risen to the top of Mount Everest. Uh, why is it so difficult? It's because people have different views of the nature of the problem. Uh, do people need cheap energy? Do they need less CO2 emissions? Do they need more secure supplies? Does what's happening today matter more than what happens tomorrow? There is no one utility function under which all mankind makes decisions. We are a complex tribe, and this is a political process. In my view, it's about as a political process as the GATT agreements are. And that took, you know, 50 to 60 years, American hegemony, uh, both economically and politically, and you kind of, and the residue of World War II to get agreement. And we're not nearly that bad yet to get agreement. Uh, the three things that I think interact with one another are low cost reliable energy. Uh, I think developing nations need it to lift their people out of poverty. But developed nations need it to unstick their stagnant economies. Uh, and you can see the effect of low cost energy on a, developing, on a developed nation by looking at the impact of natural gas on the United States hugely favorable impact. Uh, similarly, people need to worry about secure supplies. In my lifetime, I have seen nations do ridiculously stupid things because they feel threatened about their supplies of energy. So if they're insecure, goodness knows what they can do. And then finally, increasingly, we need zero net carbon. And I don't mean the kinds of things we're talking about in Paris, where we're going to agree on stable levels. The world's going to heat until you revert, until you drive carbon emissions to zero, to zero. Because carbon emissions are driven by the cumulative amount, our heating is driven by the cumulative amount in the air, not this year's addition. So you've got to get it to zero. And at least right now, none of us know how to get carbon out of the atmosphere once it's in the atmosphere. Will there be inventions? I doubt if there will be inventions in my lifetime. There may be inventions in your lifetime, but it's iffy because none of us know it. So uh, Yogi Berra died this week. I liked Yogi Berra. I liked his quotes. He said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, that's a thing we should all remember. I love the way he said things. Uh, this is the EIA 2013 projections for CO2 emissions worldwide, all sources. By the way, in November, the EIA will come out with new projections. And the International Energy Agency is going to reforecast its view of emissions because they've become uncomfortable with the ones they released earlier this year. So there'll be a bunch of new data on the table. But I think we can already, we already know what a lot of that's going to be. Uh, Chinese emissions will fall from this projection. Basically, not because China is more efficient, not because renewables have saved emissions, but because nobody thinks China is going to grow as fast now as they did in 2013. So the overwhelming feature is a slowing of China's growth, not a testament for renewables. Second, if you look at the line up here for India, ah, how do I do that? How do I do this? Well, maybe I don't do it. If you look at the line for India, pardon me. If you look at the line for India, it's the orange one, and you know it's a very small line. Because in 2013, it's not that India didn't want the power, it's that nobody at EIA thought they could execute. Between now and the 2015 report, we'll see a substantial increase in the Indian line. The net effect will be that this overall line will go up. China will stabilize, India will go up, and most of the rest of the developing world will not be substantially changed. What's the impact of that? If you integrate all of that emission into the cumulative carbon uh, emitted, by 2100, we will be in this range of the IPC's projections of climate change. We'll be in the four plus degrees centigrade uh, range of temperature projection. And in fact, if we keep it up, we'll be moving towards six degrees centigrade. I promise you, nobody knows what the biological and economic effects of six degrees of centigrade are. We can pretend to forecast it, 
but there's no we know. It, by the way, it may not be as bad as we think, or it could be much worse. We just don't know. You're going to enter a period of time in world history where the consequences of our actions are pretty much unknown. And right now, the people that we pay to warn us are barking. <laughs> the dogs are barking. And at the moment, there's nothing on the horizon as seen by the EIA or the IEA that substantially changes this picture. And we ought to do something about it, in my opinion. So this is another cartoon, about 20 years old. We are all going over the cliff together. Even the guys who can afford to pay 45 cents a kilowatt hour for power and buy it at Hinkley Point. <laughs> We're all going to go over the cliff unless we figure out a solution to this problem. So let's look into the detail of it. This is the detail by source of energy by part of the world. Again, the dark column is 2010. The light column is the projection for 2040. You see a U.S. economy that's by and large governed by a shift to natural gas. The 2015 forecast that we expect will show even more of a shift to natural gas. Uh, the China economy that you see is heavily driven by coal. We don't see anything that's going to substantially reduce that. There will be increases in the renewable lines, but those renewables are used such a low percentage of the time that the amount of coal capacity going in will be about the same. And then if you look at Europe, energy is spread across many different sources where the assumption is there's going to be a big input of wind, primarily in the North Sea, primarily into Germany. A thing to think about is if you look at the y-axis there, the top of the European axis ends at about 300. The top of the U.S. axis ends at about 600. And the top of the Chinese axis ends at about 1,200. What China's doing in coal dwarfs what everybody else does. If you made carbon-free emissions in the U.S. and in Europe, it would have little impact on the heating that's going to be coming. We need to find better solutions. This is capacity, so you'd take the, all the renewable lines and multiply them by 0.5 or 0.3, and most of these other lines by 0.9 or 0.85 because of the intermittency issue. If you look at China and you look at India separately, you notice that they're following essentially the same pattern. And if anything, the Indian emissions in coal are expected to increase over what was believed in 2013 in large part because of financing that's being made, by, um, being made available by China and by the commitment of the Indian government to get more of their people out of poverty. Uh, the thing that's scary about this is that the China column, again, is, ends at you know, 1,200 or so. The Indian column ends at about 250. And the India wants to do everything it can to have a, the same absolute amount of power to its people as the Chinese do. So I think we've got a situation here where we need to think carefully about what we're doing because we're entering something we can't reverse easily. Why are they doing this? You forget how wealthy the U.S. and Europe are compared to India and to China. I mean, it's, it's stunning when you think about all the things you hear people complain about in the West that people live with uh, in other parts of the world. A thing that may not be as clear to you is this is a comparison of health effects. And I'm going to walk over here for which I apologize. This is 2002 data, by the way, that Lancet has given us new information in 2015, which people are in the midst of, of, of analyzing. And it shows the absolute deaths due to pollution, dirty water and sanitation, that's primarily diarrhea, indoor air pollution, which is heating and cooking primarily with biomass, and outdoor air pollution, which is dominantly coal in these two regions. If you look at it from an absolute number of deaths point of view, India has, is much, more, uh, much tougher than China. Uh, China has many more deaths due to outdoor air pollution, about the same number of deaths due to indoor air pollution, and substantially fewer deaths due to diarrhea primarily because urbanization has been effective at getting sanitation delivered to a whole bunch of people. And incomes have risen to deliver better nutrition. And the energy has to propel that has come from coal. If you look at that on a per capita basis, though, 
China's done much, much better than India. So the thing about coal pollution is it saves lives. It's, it's bad, but it saves lives because no power is infinitely worse than power that's dirty. By the way, this is the 2012 data for the worst polluted cities in the world. What hits you from that list? There's not a Chinese name up there. China can finally afford to complain about air quality, like Dusseldorf did, like London did, like Pittsburgh did, like Chicago did. You don't hear more complaining here because people have much more problems with diarrhea, much more problems with nutrition, much more problems with standard of living, and so the roar is, low, is lower. Uh, so with all of that input, they're building coal. And maybe you're saying, well, they don't know about renewables. Well, they're building about as many renewables as anybody else in the world. Maybe they don't know about nuclear. This is a piece of work done by, um, John, this, this has got to be your colleague, right? Charles Frank at Brookings? Uh, I didn't work with him. Yeah, yeah. But it's, this is, this is uh, 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 misleading because it's for the United States. And by the way, it would be, there are probably four or five of these that make sense for the complete United States. But the rough priorities there pretty much around the world. You'll periodically see natural gas lose to nuclear, but essentially it's comparing where can you beat coal. So for the US, when you take everything all in, onshore wind is about equal to coal in the US today. Solar is substantially more costly than coal today in the US, unless you're in an extremely sunny part of the world. By the way, hydro beats coal, nuclear beats coal, and gas creams coal, <laughs> which is a large part why the distributions look the way they do. Uh, by the way, you can access uh, Charles Frank's paper. I've got a quote on each one of these, and there's been a lot of complaining about it. The numbers have moved around, but I want to get you to, the, to that basic point that sometimes nuclear and gas shift, but usually the analysis anywhere in the world looks about this way because of the intermittency of solar and wind. And the, and the need that people have for baseload power. So maybe, maybe they're confused in the rest of the world because they're just not building any nuclear power plants. This is where they're building nuclear power plants. They're building them in India and China and in Russia. So they're burning coal. They're building nuclear power plants. What does Yogi say? You observe a lot by just watching. Nuclear power is too expensive, and they can't scale it fast enough. So they're building coal plants. So what do you do? You got to make it cheaper than coal, and you got to make it as scalable as coal, or they're going to build coal plants. This week, somewhere in the world, one gigawatt of coal will be commissioned. Next week, another gigawatt. By the way, if the economy was hot, it'd be three gigawatts. It's already down by half from what it was last year. But the coal plants are getting built. And every time a coal can plant gets built, about 0.5% of the remaining carbon budget we have to manage our temperature goes away forever. Put the dime in the machine, it's gone. You build a coal plant, the CO2 comes out the stack, the coal plant runs for 50 years, you put up about 50 uh, uh, a million uh, pounds of, of carbon. So they're making their choices. The IEA and the EIA are telling us what their choices are. They're going to build coal plants. Uh, is there an alternative? I'm going to focus on a particular SMR supplier, uh, primarily because I have their data. They're not better than any other SMR supplier. But for a bunch of years, as you look at the evolution of nuclear power plants, and this is all kind of one gigawatt plants, this is the amount of steel, and that's what I want to point you at, that was used to construct a plant in generation two, generation three, generation three plus, and generation four plus plants. And the thing I want to point out is there's a new generation of plants coming around that use dramatically less material. It doesn't matter what things cost. It's how many man hours, how much concrete, how much steel. 
What's, it's, that's the resource that matters, and can you tolerate it up? And there are a group of people who are beginning to come up with a series of designs which are much less material expensive. Now, I put up, uh, and there, there are four bodies of these. They're light water reactors, they're sodium uh, cooled reactors, they're high temperature gas reactors, they're molten salt reactors that are all being developed by people around the world. Uh, they have different characteristics. The overwhelming characteristic as you move in this direction is they move away from infrastructure style construction like you and I see when we see highways built to having everything built in a factory and shipped to the location. Or if it's not all built in the factory, broken into pieces and shipped into locations. Uh, there are different trade-offs based on the reactor physics uh, and a lot of academic work that says this is the most mature, this is the second most mature, this is the third most mature, and molten salt is the least mature in terms of just the number of units that have been built and the degree to which they're well understood. So I put up this slide in June just so I could talk to a group of guys. And I said, you know, if I look at learning curves, the thing that matters is you've got to get the price of power beneath that of pulverized supercritical coal in Asia, or they're going to build coal plants. And by the way, if you don't get it beneath the cost of natural gas plants uh, and combined cycle gas turbines in North America, the Americans are going to build, are going to burn natural gas. Europeans don't have a lot of natural gas to burn unless it's Russian or imported. Uh, and uh, again, they're, they're so much smaller than the rest of the game. Uh, so anyway, I published this, and the great, a great thing happened. Uh, this got picked up and put in Forbes magazine, and 5,000 people read the article. And I got hundreds of emails. And the thing that matters is that these companies emailed me, and they all said, we can beat these prices if you will let us. We can beat these prices if you can let us. And all I've put in here is the names of the people that sent me emails that said, hey, I want to talk to you. I think we can beat these prices. By the way, I have no idea if they can. I just think we ought to let them try. The second thing they have to do is be able to scale. To be able to scale, you need to be able to build these things in factories. Uh, but I want to put it in perspective. Uh, you could build 50 to 100 gigawatts of power a year in one factory about the size of the Airbus plant in Toulouse or the Boeing plant in Seattle. Just to put it in perspective, if you put your mind at it. Men know how to do these things. We do them with wide body jets. We do them with container ships in good times. But unless you're in the 50 to 100 gigawatt range, and pretty soon, people are going to put out supercritical coal plants. Where does 50 to 100 come from? It comes from the installation rate of supercritical coal plants. You got to be cheaper, and you got to be able to install as fast. Uh, so anyway, my opinion, everybody I've met from China or India is committed to having their people have Western per capita economic and public health, health standards, maybe not German, maybe not California, uh, but maybe Arkansas and Sicily. Uh, in my opinion, we need to use markets, so I'm a big supporter of carbon taxes and quotas. But bluntly, unless we do something different than anybody sees today, the carbon's going to go in the air unless we do something about it. Everybody's telling us what they're going to do, and the only people who can act in time are us. So what do I think we ought to do? I think there are a bunch of new designs on the drawing board are partially proved up. Uh, and I think that we need to let private uh, financing finance these, at least in the United States. Private financing in Europe is a more problematic thing. But in America, I don't think it's a, 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 a big problem. In Asia, I don't think it's necessarily a big problem. The world must develop uh, ways to let people test these designs and iterate them quickly. In airplanes, FAA, in drugs, FDA, people run experiments. They then go to the regulatory authority and say, can I sell my product? Not in nuclear. You get a license before you can run the experiments. 
That slows down the iteration rate. It increases dramatically the cost of moving through the process. Uh, three, I think the way to begin to attack this is to create multiple reactor test facilities around the world. United States, Australia. By the way, the Europeans might co collaborate on one that was located in Canada, even though, by the way, you could do the testing in Norway if you wanted to. There are caverns in Norway. There's even salt mines where you are where you could actually test these things if you chose to. Uh, and, then, and then prior to using these facilities, uh, uh, the conditions under that, what they would, uh, how they would be administered would be declared by the host country. But in drugs, if you don't want to approve my drug, I can go to another authority and approve it. I can do the testing in one country and take it to a guy who needs it and say, do you think it's okay? So I want the same thing for nuclear that you have for aircraft and that you have for drugs. Uh, and then I think you ought to prioritize access based on people who can beat five cents a kilowatt hour and can scale their designs, because that's what will be coal. You don't beat coal, doesn't matter what you do. You're going to build some demonstration reactors and watch the world fry. Finally, I think you, that means me at Harvard, but you at New Scale and you for the EU and you at DOE ought to go into COP and move nuclear from the back page of the document into the middle of the document and put in place places where this problem can be attacked, namely these prototype sites. Again, financed by private capital, administered and controlled by host governments and their regulators, but moving fast, moving as though time mattered. Uh, the way people talk about this problem, it is a Gordian knot. And I don't know uh, how you cut the Gordian knot, but I do know how it's cut most frequently in the United States. It's not cut by a tool, it's cut by an entrepreneur. The Gordian knot wasn't cut by a sword, it was cut by Alexander the Great who figured out how to use the sword. And in this area, we have not unleashed our entrepreneurs in India and in China, in the UK, in Holland, etc and giving them the tools to be as aggressive as they need to be. And that's what I'm arguing for. And I think we ought to do that before it's too late. And the sand is running out of the clock. Thank you very much. Now we have some, you know, Plenty of seats. You can sit right up in front, too, because we're now up here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Joe. I, I thought that was a great presentation, and it was a presentation that I think, whether you agree with it or not, was easily understandable. Good. And, uh, <laughs> Good. and so I think that uh, it, it was really helpful. Uh, our first, the first member of the panel who I'd like to ask to uh, to say uh, uh, a few things uh, will be uh, John Elkind, who I introduced earlier, Assistant Secretary of Energy. John may not be able to stay for the whole program, uh, so I want to make sure that he gets on now. And uh, let me ask you, uh, John, what's your reaction to all of this uh, in the context of China's quest for energy resources and U.S.-China energy and climate relationship, particularly after President, uh, President Xi's visit, and I know you're not in the nuclear part of the Department of Energy, but I know you've mentioned to me before th some thoughts that you had on the future of, uh, 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 the future of this kind of technology, and uh, uh, so if you would uh, say a few words on all of that, or whatever else you want. Thank you, Dick, and thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at uh, Atlantic Council uh, this afternoon, and with uh, a great group of uh, fellow uh, panelists. I'm sorry that I won't be able to stick around till the, the end of the program today, um, but uh, I have to, I'll have to run back. Um, as Dick has indicated, I'm going to uh, provide some context um, about how we are looking at the energy and climate collaborations uh, uh, with China. Um, uh, obviously, this, these remarks come on the heels of the, uh, the uh, visit at the end of last week by President Xi Jinping. 
but this, uh, though that gives a particular timeliness to these remarks, um, uh, it's a broader perspective and a longer and a longer look. Um, let me start with the the point that's somewhere in the neighborhood of blindingly obvious, which is if you look at the magnitude of the um, uh, uh, energy economy of China, the energy economy of the United States, compare that against the global picture, it is clear uh, that uh, if we are to achieve success on our energy and climate agenda that we have going forward, particularly as we look at the decarbonization agenda that Joe Lasseter just was uh, talking about, um, this is a clear case that one cannot get to where we need to go uh, unless there is a successful outcome for the perspective of both the United States and China. You could expand that thought um, or, or drill into it a little bit more, pardon me, um, if you look at any parameter of uh, the Chinese and U.S. energy economies. Uh, uh, China is now uh, the, the largest uh, energy consumer, largest oil importer, largest coal, uh, coal consumer. Um, you know, the superlatives come one after another. Um, and so if you're talking about market uh, impact, uh, if you're talking about opportunity for technology, again, I come back to this basic point, which is uh, you can't get there unless uh, it, uh, you are describing um, an outcome that involves success for the United States and for China. Um, now, if that's true, then I want to pick up on uh, one of the themes that Joe Lasseter was just emphasizing um, as a framing consideration, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the highlights of how we are engaging uh, with China, how the energy and climate issues featured in uh, President Xi's uh, state visit at the end of last week. Joe emphasized learning curves and the, 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 uh, the business of reducing costs progressively over time through deployment of uh, new technology in the marketplace. And this idea of innovation and cost reduction must be an utterly central part of how we think about the challenges going forward. And indeed, those are uh, uh, absolutely essential parts of how we are thinking about our um, uh, collaborations uh, with China. Now, last week, as people I think may be aware to some degree, um, the two presidents released a, um, a shared vision of uh, uh, progress on the climate issue between now and the end of the year. Um, that shared vision is noteworthy because it calls out the importance of technology, the importance of diversified uh, portfolios of energy uh, solutions. In that context, um, nuclear will be a, a, an absolutely critical part of the mix. Um, as a matter of fact, the Chinese government has indicated that as part of the, uh, the growth in non-fossil, the non-fossil share of their economy that they anticipate between now uh, and 2030, that you'll see a growth of nuclear capacity from about 23 gigawatts um, at present to about 150 gigawatts by 2030. Now, those are the kind of numbers that are so ambitious that in most other contexts, uh, you would have to call into question whether they are going to be realized. Um, the thing that I think many of us have observed in watching China's energy development over the last several years is that the tempo of, uh, uh, of change, the scale of investment, um, is so uh, startling uh, that numbers which would seem like science fiction in most other parts of the world um, end up uh, being, um, at a minimum, plausible uh, in the case of uh, our Chinese colleagues. Um, other important um, pieces that came out of, the, out of the discussion last week that are worth uh, highlighting, both China and the United States um, uh, announced a series of uh, and, and highlighted a series of domestic clean energy initiatives that each country is uh, taking in its own context. Um, on the Chinese side, I think uh, one of the uh, announcements that gained uh, the most attention was the announcement of uh, China's plan uh, to institute a, na a na <clears throat> nationwide 
cap and trade system by 2017, uh, covering emissions from a, a range of major emitting sources, uh, from metallurgy to power generation uh, to cement uh, and several other uh, major sectors. We also found it Im important uh, that the Chinese president announced um, a pledge of $3.1 billion to support um, uh, uh, climate uh, finance. Uh, uh, the U.S., as uh, many of you will know, um, had made a, a $3 billion uh, pledge as well for the uh, Green Climate Fund. Now, in the minute or so remaining, let me take a couple of, uh, 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 a drive-by of a couple of the highlights of our ongoing collaborations with China, um, again, to draw out some of the the, the main themes. Um, one I've already commented on is uh, the importance of innovation. Um, if you look at some of the other must-deliver uh, technology sp uh, spaces, such as carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, um, we are all looking for um, more deployments that translate into technological learnings and cost reduction. Um, uh, and so in that context, it's particularly important that um, the, uh, both in the, in the framework of the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, we have U.S. and Chinese research teams. Um, uh, we have U.S. and Chinese industry partners working together to demonstrate technologies on U.S. platforms and on Chinese platforms. Um, reducing the cost, improving the performance uh, of uh, the carbon capture uh, mechanisms, uh, the utilization schemes, um, and now also for the first time we will be working on a large-scale sequestration uh, project, U.S. and China, with other partners, we hope, uh, in order to uh, engage in a rigorous assessment of the fate and transport of sequestered carbon uh, in a saline aquifer uh, deep underground. Our Clean Energy Research Center that I mentioned a moment ago also covers uh, important work in relation to um, energy efficient buildings uh, uh, and uh, uh, clean vehicles. We are now inaugurating as well two new tracks, uh, one that focuses on the energy water nexus, the, the, the points of interconnection between our energy systems and our um, use of water and the relationships that go in the other direction as well. And then the most recent announcement, which came out on Friday, um, a, a new track focusing on medium and heavy duty vehicles in order to significantly improve on the efficiency uh, of those collaborations. Uh, in the same way as we've seen through the super trucks uh, program domestically. Um, let me just conclude by saying that our, um, our nuclear collaboration in particular um, consists both of government to government elements uh, in the research space, uh, but also very importantly, uh, uh, company to company relationships. Um, here it is uh, I, worthy of a uh, reminder that um, Westinghouse's AP1000 projects that are under construction in China are the very same technology uh, being built in uh, uh, two locations across the United States, the first uh, new builds in civil nuclear um, in decades. Uh, we have a shared stake in seeing the companies that are the, the, uh, the sponsors, uh, the orderers, and the deliverers of those projects uh, succeed in those, uh, in those efforts. We also have a shared stake um, in the kind of structures uh, that can incent and facilitate more commercial collaborations. And here I'm referring in particular to the challenge of uh, proper handling of uh, liability issues in the nuclear sector. The uh, Convention on Supplementary Comp Compensation uh, for Nuclear Damages uh, entered into force this year after China, excuse me, after Japan's uh, ratification. Uh, we look forward to working with China and with uh, companies that are active in the sector uh, in order to make sure that uh, liability is handled properly, uh, is handled responsibly, and that from that we're able to uh, support um, safe, 
uh, responsible, effective, uh, and affordable uh, nuclear application uh, implementation in, in our respective economies. Dick, with that, I'll stop. And uh, I, again, I apologize for having to slip out um, in about 15 minutes. But yeah. Can I just ask you, if, if, and maybe for a one minute answer so we can get to the others. I've heard Secretary Moniz talk about small module reactors, and, uh, uh, and at least generally in a positive way. From what you know of what's going on in DOE, do you have any comments on that technology? Well, in general, the approach that DOE is taking in the technology space is a portfolio approach. I mean, we don't know um, whether the uh, most effective, cost-effective, and, and uh, w strongly performing technologies will be new scales or uh, a competitor. Um, uh, I bet Mr. Hopkins has a view on that. Uh, um, uh, we don't know whether the, the, the best answers will lie in the nuclear SMR space uh, or in uh, you know, uh, hybrid uh, wind and storage for all I'm, I'm pulling it. I'm pulling something out of uh, out of my uh, hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or something. The, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of the point. Is is I, I want to underscore, Dick, the 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 role that is played not only by the innovators in companies like New Scale or or others that are represented here in this room. Um, but also the, the role that I would assert is properly played by the federal government, in the case of the United States, in helping to pave the way, and in some uh, cases for new technologies that we need to see whether they will uh, take root and grow. That means helping to reduce some of the, the front end costs on a cost share basis with industry. Okay, well so then having said that, that does segue into uh, uh, comments that I'd like, to, you know, hear that we'd like to hear. I think from you, John, uh, on where you see the current stage uh, of SMR development as to what you're doing and uh, how you see it being utilized in, in, in rapidly developing countries, maybe other countries as well, and the challenges that you see, given you know what you've heard from Joe, what you've heard from John. What are where are you at this point? Certainly. Just a quick background. Uh, 20 years with Floor Corporation, who's the primary investor in New Scale. They own 96% of the preferred stock. Uh, they, to date, they've invested in approaching $400 million currently. Uh, also, our other investor is we went through a competitive process with the Department of Energy. And uh, in 2014, we were awarded the funding opportunity assessment, which equates to about $217 million over five years. And, and to John's point, uh, DOE's been a great partner to work with. Uh, the, the reason Florida elected to get into this market, the, the new scale actually started in the year 2000, 2001, when DOE approached Oregon State University. And the, the fundamental question was, could you develop a small mod reactor from the bottoms up? We don't want a big reactor taken down, but a small with safety in mind. It wasn't about the economics at the time, it was safety. About 2007, the founders, Dr. Jose Reyes and Paul Lorenzini, determined there could be commercial applications here for small mod reactors. 2011, quickly, Floor Corporation, who is an engineering procurement construction company, I was leading the effort to do the due diligence. Uh, at that time, I was running Fleur's Emerging Market and New Ventures. I actually received a call from Rolls-Royce from the UK saying, I understand you're looking at perhaps what small modules are all about, and at that time, uh, the definition for small modular reactors, and still is, you know, in the 300 megawatt um, category. But and again, there's differences. You mentioned the Gen 4 advanced reactors. We're we're a light water pressurized reactor. So 2011, the investment hypothesis floor is very simple. Um, you know, if you're here to think that it's going to be a quick return, it's not going to happen. If you believe from the energy requirements globally out to you know, 2030, 2035 and beyond, there's going to be a world without nuclear, then it's not for us either. Then I got into the particular applications of small mod reactors. See, I'm a big believer the predominant use of these things obviously is going to be electricity. We've written five papers to date. One is on the use of desalinization. To me, I think it's going to be a huge global 
issue. When you look at reverse osmosis, you look at the energy requirements, like Singapore is doing as an example, Saudi Arabia and others, there's a place for small modular reactors in that. We've written that paper. And by the way, I would go to our website because I want to keep as much information on that website as possible. Um, we're seeing advancements in small modular reactors in other locations. Uh, I was just in China a week before President Xi came over. I met with uh, China National Nuclear Corporation. They're looking at what's called the ASP 100 plus. If you look at the rendition, rendition it looks very similar to us, quite frankly. Uh, it's got a heat sink in water, et cetera. They're a 100 megawatt, uh, where new scale power, and one of the, the things that I liked about it when I did the due diligence, they're, they're a 50 megawatt electric each module. The reason for 50 megawatt was because we, we needed to legitimately say that we could, as was mentioned, build these, not only the containment, but the reactor in a factory and are portable and shippable because you could tremendously drive price down. As a business person, the question I get asked all the time, safety is a given, are you going to be commercially viable? And that's the question we get asked everywhere I'm at. And the beauty of having a floor corporation who's an engineering procurement construction company they came in and did an eight-month assessment, bottom line, 15,000 line item estimate of what's the first of a kind of these plants going to be built. And we also presented the data to the National Nuclear Laboratory in the UK. And we're in the we're first of a kind plant, we're competitive. And again, go to my website and we'll run through the whole numbers on that website. So, and the reason for 50 megawatt, that was the envelope of size that we felt we could actually build these things in a factory. We've had seismic experts come up and look at the height of these, the, the total height of the reactor in the containment is about 73 feet, 15 feet in diameter, comes in three parts. So, if I look at the competitors out there, th th there's a broad range. We're, I'm hoping we're going to go through a competitive process in the UK coming up. They're looking at them. Um, and, you know, and I'm not competing against large reactors. I'm not competing against the renewables. Another paper we just pr published, and we go through ITAC in Paris to validate the numbers, is our ability to load follow. Um, as we know, it's an intermittent power, be it wind or solar. A lot of these plants require natural gas to offset and to get to nameplate capacity. I think there could be opportunities for SMRs. The other beauty of SMRs, as I see it, you know, in, if, in, in the size duration, the scalability, you know, and the affordability. We get into the cost of these things. Our, our, we're submitting our DCA next year, 2016. We're 80% complete right now for the DCA submittal. We have the NRC's attention. We're the only one I'm aware of right now that they're actually proposed as a design. So once we get through that process, uh, we have a customer in Utah, I don't have the time to get into it, that their first customer for coal replacement is they're requiring 60 megawatt, or 600 megawatts be operational first in the ground by the 2023 timeframe. We certainly hope we can achieve that because they're putting a considerable amount of money in this for their COLA and et cetera. And uh, our operating company will be Energy Northwest, the CEO is Mark Redman. So we have the first customer. We now have to get through the NRC requirements. If I had a challenge as it relates to the NRC is they don't know small modular reactors. We've been engaged with them with the company since 2008, but it's different. There's a lot of stuff that the big reactors require that we don't. A hydrogen recombiner. We don't have hydrogen because they're built in a vacuum. So there's a lot of things we're educating the NRC about as it relates to topical papers. But uh, I don't want to get into it. I'll get into the competition a little bit if uh, <laughs> another question. But. Yeah, let, me, let me ask just again for maybe a brief, a brief answer. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people will immediately, you know, maybe an obvious question from a layperson. Well, what about safety? Uh, how, do, how, do these, how do you see these new reactors comparing from a safety standpoint to traditional reactors? I think like any technology, you look at over a car that's changed over 40 years and the safety features that a car 40 years ago compared to a car today, nuclear advancements have done the same thing. If I, you know, people ask me about Fukushima all the time, post-Fukushima. China just announced that they're going to start building, if they get the final approvals, 31 additional construction nuclear plants inland, which they stopped post-Fukushima for concerns of safety. Now they've gone through their the rigor and they decided they're going to go forward. One of the aspects I liked about this small reactor, it's everything is, it's a standard 17 by 17 fuel. It's uh, less than 5% as required uh, for enrichment. 
But the beauty of these small reactors is that the, the coping time for us is indefinite. So I could probably legitimately say, in fact, I'm going to be in uh, Japan on Monday. Mehdi has asked me to come over to give a presentation. The, the safety aspects of these small reactors, the plant will cool itself down. If you think what happened to Fukushima, it wasn't the earthquake that generated the problem. It was when a tsunami hit and knocked out the electrical. Therefore, the cooling pumps couldn't advance and cool the plant down. We have no pumps. We have no external pumps. Basically, it's all by natural physics, convection, and natural circulation. And again, you'll see if you go on the website how, in fact, we call it the triple crown. So if you had a station blackout in our facility, and we do a lot of dynamic simulation, we have a full simulator set up, uh, we have NRC in there quite often, and if you look at the dynamic simulation that we go through, um, this plant will cool itself down with no additional water, no additional operator involvement, and um, what's the third one? Oh, we, and again, no pumps. So uh, that, that to me, it's not about safety anymore. It's extraordinary safety. It's getting the message out to where, and what we're working with the NRC right now because of the safety, the current emergency planning zone for large reactors is a 10-mile radius. We believe the science and the technology will be there to state that we could get our emergency planning zone to somewhere close to site boundary limits. So I don't think it's going to be the science or the technical. It's going to be the community outreach, outreach to get people comfortable that's doable. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to we saw the natural con convection transient in 1982 yeah. for the fast flux test facility. That's right. I was the lead person for that. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then f uh, just for the last initial comments, and then we'll open it up to, uh, uh, to all of you for, for your questions. Uh, Vashlov, you know, you've been working on nuclear issues, well, certainly since I've known you in 2009, and I'm, I guess it goes well, be, you know, well before that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I know you've even worked with some of the companies that are here in this room today. Uh, and... What's your and and you've done some work uh, with respect to SMRs and you've looked I mean you've looked at those possibilities, uh, given what you've heard today, uh, what where do you see things going uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, nuclear energy and the ability of maybe reactors such as this to do what Joe is looking for, uh, you know, lower cost uh, alternatives to uh, to coal is this realistic or is it uh, you know a, a, a pipe dream well th first of all thank you for the, thank you for the invitation uh, I've been overseeing the nuclear tender we had in the last four years so I've, I was a, visited all sites of generation three in the world most more than four times in the last four years so I, I think I can speak with some certainty about at least the leading companies in the field a uh, small detail which I think is telling and for me as a government employee and in the end, in most countries, governments will be somehow involved in this. Uh, the most telling detail, I have not seen a single site in anywhere in the world which would be on time on budget. And when you hear that, when you hear that for a second time, third time, tenth time, you, you get cold feet. That's quite usual. You don't have to go to extremes like the El Kyoto site in Finland, which is now nine years behind schedule. You can just go to others which are only three or four or five years behind schedule. So. When I hear about new designs and first of its kind, I'm just careful because uh, when we said, uh, actually I proposed a date back in 2010 that we would choose new tech, new design or new supplier for our new additional plants in 2013, it was because all three bidders which we had at the time were promising to have the first unit of generation three up and running in 2013. That, did ha that didn't happen. It didn't happen last year, will not happen this year, will not happen next year. So just that's my caution from the side. I think that we tend to underestimate the amount of loss of know-how of the companies involved, the loss of know-how for the construction. You, know, you go to the sites in China. I went to four different sites in China and realized that all nuclear welding in Nuclear Island on all four sites, Sanmen, Haiyang, Taishan, and Tianwan, was done by the same people because that level of knowledge is simply available only in a certain part of very specific community of welders from military background. So just a small detail. That's one thing over, over, overall. So in general, I, I believe in nuclear. We are a nuclear country. We have one-third of electricity from nuclear. 
We have 70% public support for nuclear, so we are not anti that at all. But careful, that will be the word. And if you prove what you said, we'll be happy. Second thing is specific to China, it's something uh, probably would be difficult to explain to many Americans, but uh, I will try. Uh, it's something more linked to the past of my country, let's say 25 years ago. I had the opportunity to meet all the leaders of the big companies from the CNNC, CGNPC, which is now CGN, CPI, SNPTC. If you do China, you will understand those abbreviations. If you don't, let's see, those are all the big players in Chinese nuclear field. It's very difficult in China to explain to your leadership why your project is four years behind. If all other big projects in that country are basically on time, all of them, then your future as a CEO of the company or the project manager of that particular construction site is not a particular rosy one. I don't want to go into details, but basically, if the first unit at Salman 1 was finished in November 2013, the guy overseeing that would probably be now member of, a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, maybe one of the pretenders to be the next Minister of Energy. The same goes for Taishan 1, which was supposed to be online in December 2013. Uh, they'll be lucky if they will be able to keep jobs somewhere in the coastal area and not end up in Inner Mongolia. So please, when you go to China and talk to them, understand also that there is this very understandable motivation on their side. It's a country which does not forgive mistakes or delays very easily. And I fully understand them. The worst thing which can happen to me or you is that we lose our jobs. You will probably not be moved to North Dakota. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Good. He's already in Montana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, okay, here we go. So that's just a, a particular detail. I, I really visited most of the sites in China four times over those four, four years. And I saw genuine worry of the people, and they were kept asking me questions which I understood were fundamental for them. And I have great respect for them, and I, th I think that they, they were, in the end, probably one of the biggest markets for SMRs. One, they are proven technology. At this moment, if you say first of its kind, well, that's a hard sell because they've been doing first of its kind on several projects in the same time in nuclear field. And it's not a pleasant experience so far. So basically, your attitude is, hey, I'm listening to all this stuff. Prove it. Well, I've heard so many promises yeah. from the makers, from the, from the companies which make nuclear kit. And they did not meet the deadlines. So I, I, I like the people, and I like the industry. In the same time, I work for the government, for the possible buyer or overseer, and I want them to fulfill what they say. Okay, good. I know, John, you have to disappear. Thank you for, uh, uh, thank thank you. You for coming. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's open it up. Do we, have micro do we have microphones? Yeah, and if you can identify yourself, first question over there. Thank you. I'm Kristen. I'm a China analyst at the State Department. Um, so I'm excited to be able to ask people who've actually visited uh, the Chinese um, nuclear sites questions. That's not something I get to do often. Um, so I have a question about safety and the Chinese design of the reactors. You mentioned the AP-1000 design is being built in China, but that's, you know, two, possibly more of at least 31 more that are going to be built, and most of them are going to be the Chinese indigenous design. And so having visited the sites, what's your sense of, like, for example, the, the detail that the welders are all the same of the island. It's in, interesting bits like that in terms of the safety of the indigenous design or just the management where, you know, we talk about, you know, safety culture, stuff like that. So any comments you have on the indigenous build out of China's um, nuclear reactors would be helpful. Maybe yeah, just one short comment. I, on most of my trips, I took with me either the deputy chairman of our, of, our, of our regulator or somebody who's really experienced, who spent 20, 25 years in the field. And they were usually shocked by the sites in China because they are the cleanest and most well-organized you can find anywhere in the world. 
And once you spend 25 years in this field and you see quite a lot of messy places, you appreciate that. So I think that on the safety side, I don't think that I've, I've seen any questions or doubts about this. My only comment is, I just came back from there, and the reason those 31 reactors post Fukushima stopped with safety concerns, because what China's, they're looking for legitimacy in the world right now to be able to come out as a, with a nuclear capability. And they understand one safety incident will totally shut that down. So they're very cognizant of the safety, and uh, they're also, um, one of the reasons we've been talking a lot of them is in, in, in our government, from in both the non-proliferation and the safety aspect, you know, the AP-1000 went through NRC licensing here in this country and then moved it to China. So, you know, from a safety, I mean, that's something I think our government's readily accepted is the fact they went through that process and uh, to be able to move that technology, you know, NRC likes to view themselves as a gold standard and to be able to promote that technology elsewhere has been a good thing. But that's, well, that's not, I mean, some of their reactions. You're talking about their indigenous? It's a good question. I, I just know that they're very cognizant of the fact that, that to, to receive this legitimacy, CNC and CGN right now are looking to invest in the UK at a very major project called Hinkley Point, EDF. It's nominally about 24 billion pounds to your, and, and probably going to go up. And, uh, oh, yeah. But they're looking to become a significant investor in that project. And part of it is to get, I think, that leg legitimacy in the world. So the UK has begun their safety review of CDM. Yeah, it's a French design. It's EDF. and uh, EPR. Yeah. Do you have anything? Yeah, just uh, to, the, again, I think the thing to think about is what their forecasts are telling us. And their forecasts are telling us they've got a cost problem, not a safety problem. And they're not going to build nearly enough reactors to slow down global warming. They're going to build supercritical steam plants. <laughs> and they're going to build one and a half, a half to one per week. So they, they voted on the economics, they voted on the build rate. They've told us what they're going to do. And I think the emissions and the deaths that are associated with those coal plants will dwarf anything that happens in their nuclear field. We've, just gone, we've gone used to the pollution, and we've, gone, we've forgotten how many people die in the coal industry. Okay, I've seen three hands. I'm going to go there to Ariel, and then over to you. So Thank in you. that corner. Can you stand up? And Walter Howes, ex DOE, Berkeley Capital. My question is for John. Could you just stand up, please? It's, and then you've got a microphone with, uh, for it. SMRs and time to market. You mentioned uh, 2023. So if you look around the world right now, I'm going to say there are seven to eight other reasonably credible entities in the hunt. A couple of Canada, you know, Korea is a smart reactor, yourselves, et cetera. Um, and, and aside from the NRC sort of wild card, um, many of them have raised substantial amount of private equity and other funding promising, forecasting much faster time to market than 2023, and you're ahead of just about everybody else from what we know. So I'm trying to figure out why they're talking about 21, 20, and why you're at 23 when you're arguably ahead. Is your 23 number include uh, a deployment that's not a full-scale commercial along the way, or are you going to go hot in your first deployment in 23 and go commercial at the same time? The, the current customer, and, and first of all, I, I got to... I, Everything he said is spot on as it relates to the cost of this, all this nuclear bill stuff. And uh, what our customer is 45 municipalities in Utah that are looking for coal replacement. We believe, you know, we started the NRC process in 2008. We spent over $3 million to date. Uh, we're doing all of our testing. Uh, the helical coil steam generators just went full, full scale testing and completion in Italy. All our heat flux tests were done in Canada at Stern's lab. So with the current supply chain we have, this Arriva is doing the fuel. Uh, Curtis Wright's our uh, control rod drive mechanisms. If somebody were to say today, could you deploy 12 of these today? My answer would be yes, assuming we didn't have to worry about the NRC. Right. So assuming, again, it's a big assumption that we do all our topical reports, get them to NRC, keep them focused on us, uh, we strongly believe we'll have these things deployable by 2023. But, but that's, that's building your first unit in 2023. That's the first of a kind unit, yeah. So we have a one-third scale test in uh, Oak Corvallis right now. It's electric, but right, right, right. we're doing all the tests. But commercial, commercially, we're, gonna, we're saying it will be in a, need to be 
uh, deployable by 2023. So I'm just going to within 2023. Right. So I'm going to do say what you can't say, which is it sends to me the major blockage is the NRC, not you at this time. I'm sorry. I'm going to say the major blockage in time has to do more with the NRC than it does with your commercial ability to build. Possibly, but I don't necessarily. Right now, they've been great. We have no issues working with them. They've been out to our site on numerous occasions. Uh, they've been to Italy. They've seen our testing. Uh, you know, when was the last time, for those who've worked with the NRC, have ever seen them come out and do an inspection where they had no observations and no recommendations? That's what happened on our, on our testing in Italy. They walked away, it was, it was actually pleasant. So now what we're seeing with the NRC is a shakeup right now. They just made some announcements yesterday of some shakeup, but right. um, you know, it's, uh, we just gotta stay diligent and stay with them and keep communicating. Okay. We have an office in Bethesda right next to their facility. Right. Right. So. Your career as a diplomat's preserved, I, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ariel, we have a microphone over here. RL Cohen, the Atlantic Council. Uh, question to the panel, in terms of investment, if you compare the um, current state of the art coal plants that are built in China versus your reactors or more conventional reactors, what can you tell us about the upfront investment and the cost of kilowatt later on? Thank you. We just, again, had completed last year just uh, we, we again the question gets asked can you be commercially uh, if you look at the United States right now people typically ask me how do you compete against natural gas well in a lot of areas you don't or the reason UAMPs by the way they own natural gas they own wind they own solar um, the reason they elected to go with us is because okay today if it's three dollars per million BTU what's it going to be in eight to ten years and then when you say three million dollars per BTU or three dollars per BTU at the wellhead. What's it cost to get it from where it's at at Marcellus or wherever it's coming from to the west, which is in bills, you know, pipeline, environmental permits, etc. So right now, at coal, they're at about five to six cents per kilowatt. When they did their analysis on us in comparison, we we're about for first of a kind about eight to nine cents. And because of the volatility of gas, um, if you just look at commodity prices as an example. Um, and they didn't want to put all their eggs on basket. That's why they elected to go with a small mod reactor. I'm sorry, I was asking about China. I'm sorry? I was asking about China. Oh, China. China is, if you look at the fabrication, he, the, the question he raised about construction, there's a difference now between what you're seeing, and he's exactly right, Fleur Corporation built back in the 80s. And most all these plants went, went through significant overruns for a lot of different reasons. Why I like the SMR, if and we can do what we say in terms of buildings in a factory, our unit looks like this. There's no pumps, there's no, I can put 126 of these in containment inside one large reactor, 126 of them. So if I can, in fact, get a standardization design, which I know is, you know, uh, you know it's difficult to say, and I mean, people are always gonna wanna tweak the design, but you can't do, you go through NRC licensing. If I can get these deployable, and then you take a factor like China with their fabrication capacity, and, their, and trust me, they, they, to his point, they're taking teams of people to get up that learning curve on nuclear wells. You can drive these costs down significantly. The, the, the thing that people need, I mean, the, the two bad actors, I was a naval architect by training, and in World War II, the Germans sank the ships faster we could make them. And Berkeley School of Naval Architecture and, uh, and MIT School of Naval Architecture said, you know, it just takes this long to build a reactor. And then a guy named Kaiser said, no, it doesn't. We could do it a different way. Let's build them like they were on a forward assembly line. And he finally built one in 41 days. And they did it in Sparrow Point, and they did it in 12 locations around the world. But we need a revolution here. By accepting what the world's telling us, we're going to eat through the carbon budget that we we believe is valid somewhere between 2030 and 2050, and the fat will be in the fire. But we're acting like everything will be okay. It's not okay. <laughs> we need a revolution. He's got the potential of a revolution. By the way, some other guys too. But they need to rethink this problem the way Kaiser rethought launching ships. They need to rethink fueling and maintenance. We need to have different ways to move through the testing process. Right. Uh, 
the, the building of these non-nuclear prototypes at scale is very achievable in this, in this world of modular reactors. Uh, we need to test reactors like we do airplanes, where companies build some and run the thing, not run computer programs for years, and then finally get to build something. Every other field of human endeavor will let experimentation and entrepreneurship drive rapid change. In this one, we, we don't. And yet it's one of the few that has the potential to change what our best eyes are telling us is going to happen for sure. Will there be other inventions? I hope so. But again, I don't know the, the, the old line. You know, It wasn't the sword that cut the knot. It was Alexander. <laughs> Somebody's got to say, let's change this and, and, and address all these problems. Right now, when the world looks at the industry, they draw the same conclusion. We're not going to build many of these. We're going to build coal plants. And, and I promise you, we're going to really, really regret that. And you've got 20, 30 years to change that. Once you've built the coal plant and once it's admitting, it'll stay on because its marginal cost will be half a cent uh, kilowatt hour. He needs to go faster. Yeah, uh, we need a microphone though. And if, if, if it'd be help if you could stand so older people like me can hear. Like me cannot stand. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Then if you have to, <laughs> you're up. Okay. Just a follow up on that. Uh, the, I'm outside DOE and came from MIT with Ernie Moniz. Uh, we, our goal is uh, to have carbon capture completely in coal plants by 2030 but not five cents a kilowatt or 10 cents a kilowatt is the goal. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Uh, $3,000 a kilowatt versus nuclear at six to $7,000 a kilowatt cost is the issue, not safety. We have looked at huge amounts of passive cooling, natural convection, safety generally would not be the major issue, it will be the cost. And we've de designed reactors little bigger than that's true, by the way, for space. So we know how to design reactors and we can do wonderful things very quickly. But the point is that we have to look at it from the big picture perspective where coal transportation may be a difficult issue. Mm -hmm. uh, taking things to uh, Northwest Alaska for certain uh, Energy production is a big issue. So we have to look at it from a balanced perspective. We need all of the above, and certainly uh, look at it from the point of view of which is going to be the best for carbon issues. That's about the extent. You know, the other thing that, you know, we've got to be good stewards of both our taxpayers' monies and floor money. Part of my job is, when I look at threats and opportunities, if, if I don't think at any point in time that either the market's not going to be there or the technology is not sound to carry these things forward to become commercial, you know, it's, I have a fiduciary duty to say stop. But when I look at uh, an opportunity, particularly if we're talking about coal replacement, that I can give you 600 megawatts in 32 acres. That's the fence line for 600 megawatts from an energy density perspective. You know, go build your 150 megawatt if you have 4,500 acres of land for wind and solar. That if we can get the emergency planning zone down to you know somewhere in that close proximity, when you look at existing coal facilities, they already have the existing infrastructure in a transmission and, and easily you can put a 600 megawatt plant and what is most of our coal plants? Three to 600 generally. There's one other factor. And I, I, I'll say this very quiet. Security. Absolutely, energy security. When you, I beg your pardon, I didn't mean it from that perspective. Hostile threats. A plant that is 150 acres cannot be protected as well as a small compact nuclear Good point. or a coal plant. Hmm. And people have not paid much attention to that. If we get into a scenario of that sort, we have to make sure that our 
grid infrastructure is taken care of under the worst case circumstances. That is the most Very good point. Yeah. Good. Okay, I've seen, I have a hand here and then in the back. Um, so I'm UB, I'm interning at the Center for American Progress. Um, so thank you for the panel. Um, uh, my question was, um, we all know that like China um, has like really aggressive targets to reach 20% non-fossil energy production by 2030. Um, but what's the? Um, but I was wondering like what's the rate of growth of um, nuclear nuclear energy that do you think is like realistic and viable? And what are some obstacles? And I was also wondering um, what are some ge geopolitical implications of China's nuclear energy um, efforts? Thank you. Speak, Vassilov. <laughs> Let you start. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think there's a lot of hard thinking in China uh, because we have several different designs. There's a CPR design, the domestic, former Diabe, former Framatom, French design, basically internalized by China, which is favored by many Chinese, co Chinese companies and which is being built at many sites in China at the moment. There is this Hualong project, which are basically two different projects, one by CNNC, one by CGNPC, now CGN. They're supposed to merge into one. How they will do it, I'm, I'm curious about that. You have the CAP1400, which is basically internalized, former AP1000, the US design, now being Chinese. You have several other designs as well. There will be, there already is a major fight, which I, cannot comment on much because I'm not Chinese, I don't speak Chinese, I can only talk to people who sometimes tell me things, sometimes don't. I think you're better positioned to, to know more than I do. Uh, but the, the final compromise will be probably something that Chinese can trust, the companies feel assured they can build on time, so that it will not destroy the careers of those who are involved. I think you're Chinese, so you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and. Uh, will be cost effective. At this moment, uh, there is a governmental push for the Hualong project, the Dragon. Uh, we will see how it goes. I really don't have any inside information. I, I think just like in the case of the previous wave, back in middle of the previous decade, the final call rested with the standing committee of Politburo, with the highest level of power in China. They were the ones who decided which technology will be chosen, at what size, and so forth. I think once again it will be a decision done with in Chungnan Hai. It will not be done by, by too many people. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add anything? There's, just one, 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 there, there's one thing that's, and I don't know this is true, but I bet it's true. So, John, tell me if it's not true. If you look at the one gigawatt uh, a week installation rate that takes place for uh, pulverized coal uh, in the world. Uh, and sometimes it goes up as, th as high as three. The limitation is the turbines. By the way, if you put a nuclear plant behind them, you get to use the guy's supply chain. <laughs> the, the scrubbing and coal handling and boiler infrastructure uses three times the steel that his plant does, hmm. occupies four or five times the amount of physical land, and you've got to move the ash in and the coal out. Again, the thing that matters in resources is tons of steel, amount of cement, man hours, etc. On top of that, if you go with factory manufacture, where you literally put the thing in place, you cut out all sorts of issues about bidding and construction. You don't pour concrete on site. Think of all the problems all the reactors have had by pouring concrete on rebar. You change the game. Again, until Henry Kaiser walked from the, the, the Grand Coulee Dam project to Richmond, Virginia, nobody thought you could build a boat in, you know, faster than the Germans were going to sink them. Suddenly, they, they outproduced them two or three to one. They did that in a year because they thought they had to. Every week that goes by that you let a coal plant get built and let that emission stream start, you're using up a piece of the future that you cannot recover. 
Now, by the way, it could be that the environmental damage will not be, or the CO2 heating damage will not be nearly as much as, as, as it could be. Could be that it's less. But right now, we're making a de facto decision. Instead of you know, putting John on the cover of Time Magazine because he figured out how to ship 100 of these a year, <laughs> we're going to ship 100 coal plants and do nothing about it. And I promise you, we're pretty near the last generation that can do anything about it. Again, I'll be long and dead, but you won't be. <laughs> and, and, and the price will be paid. And it's paid in energy poverty today, where people die because they don't have enough energy in India and in rural China. It's paid in dirty water. It's paid in, in inadequate sanitation. If you, could, if you could solve this problem, you could deliver U.S. levels of power to everyone on the planet for thousands and thousands of years. Think what that means. No dirty water. No problems with food or fuel. Nobody fighting over scarce resources. Think how the world changes. Every time you make an energy source of magnitude available to the world, a new future unfolds. In the area of nuclear power, you can actually unfold the, the, the door right now. In the area of renewables, it may happen. In the area of batteries, it may happen. In the area of, of uh, carbon capture, it may happen. Maybe humanity will become kind at, at Paris. But we need a certain sure alternative, in my opinion. And it's going to come from technology and rapid manufacturing. And it needs to come quick enough, because the world is telling us what they're doing. And we're doing nothing about it. I suppose you could say uh, that, uh, yeah, we need to have the Kaiser approach with respect to these nuclear reactors. But there should also be then the Kaiser approach with respect to battery technology, the Kaiser approach with respect to these me, other things me, as well. Let me make a, a difference. The great thing, the Kaiser approach works when you got something that works and you scale it. When you got something that doesn't work and you scale it, it goes very, very badly. Okay. And, and, and unfortunately, so, with, with batteries <laughs> and things like that, we have enough data to know that we don't have the economics there. And every time we pour money into that problem, we make energy expensive someplace in the world. There, there are three problems you've got to solve. Energy poverty. People die tonight because there's not enough energy. Climate for tomorrow. Energy security. You've got to cut the Gordon knot. And that means you rethink how you approach it. And I think guys like John and NewScale have shown that the technology is near to there. But you've got to get it cheaper and cold, and you've got to scale it. And, and what we should be doing is insisting that they do it, not telling them to be cautious. Yeah, it, by, the, by the way, unless mm -hmm. India decides it wants to scrub its coal, you're going to have to be at a penny and a half a kilowatt hour. I hope that they'll decide to at least scrub it, if not take the CO2 out. And I promise you, China said they're going to write the check to finance the build out of the Indian coal infrastructure. And if I was a, an Indian citizen and I lived in, in Bihar, please get me some electricity. Thank you. You know, this should have been the conclusion, but I promised there was one more oh, hand sorry. and we have about a minute left uh, on our time. So, well, I'll, last I'll question. Yes, I'll salute the, the conclusion for Dr. Lasseter, Andrew Patterson with EBI. Can you talk about market openness? And then I'd like to get John and the ambassador's comments. We, Russia's market is not open. It doesn't really matter what the cost is. I'm curious, Ambassador, what the real buy criteria are beyond cost, like Russia offering spent fuel take back. It's another feature of their sale. China going forward, Dr. Lasseter, may not be an open market. India, very difficult market. Russia's already selling 10 reactors in there. How many of the markets that you talked about are open really to John? And what are the key factors, Ambassador, driving the purchase? Just, I'll make one comment. So far, the Chinese and Indians have very often not been the first to buy things, but at least the Chinese have always responded to economics. They import their supercritical uh, uh, turbines. 
they import uh, high temperature turbines from the United States. If the economics there. Right now we don't have the economics there. So right now barriers are not the issue. The issue is we don't got a good enough alternative. Yeah, I, th I think in the developing countries that don't currently have nuclear, I think the inclination will be to go with known proven technology. If you take a country like China that does have in our discussions, I think they are open. And it gets back to, again, economics and safety. But, e you know, it's, uh, we've had many of the companies that uh, Mr. Matuska mentioned come visit us in Corvallis and actually seen what we had. And we've got 700 people working on this product right now, engineers. And, you know, fundamentally they said they would like to have a new scale technology in China. That's not been an issue. Um, at the end of the day, when it comes to central government, how they want to move forward because they are producing their own uh, is to be seen. But uh, the conversations we've had have been good. So I think those who have existing technologies are more open to the first of a kind innovative, where those who are developing that do not have nuclear are probably going to be a little more resistant and want to go with the proven. And for Europe, the situation is very simple. Uh, there is, in Central Europe, for example, right now, the price of electricity is around 32 euros per megawatt, megawatt hour. No new power plant, whether it's gas or coal or nuclear, can be built which would generate power at this price. So what you get built in Europe right now is only the guaranteed price projects, which are mostly renewables, nothing else. The governments will move ahead, just like they did in Britain with Hinkley Point C. They will move ahead with guaranteed price for nuclear projects. But they have to see finished, built nuclear projects somewhere with known cost. Until that happens, you will not see much of movement from the government side because they will be fried alive by the public. Like why do you want to spend so much public money and guarantees on something that we don't know how long it will take to be built? But in general, I think price will be always the, the prime indicator. And as long as you have very low prices for electricity in Europe right now, that would be a major problem for nuclear. But the Germans are paying much more. Well, you have to distinguish between the price of electricity on the wholesale market and what the customers pay. What really happened in Europe, thanks to the support for renewables and the energy vendor in Germany, is that in the past, the wholesale price of electricity would be roughly 80% up to 90% of what you pay as a customer. What you now pay as a customer is only 44, 45% the wholesale price of electricity. More than 50% is support for the renewables and the grid services, basically backup for renewables. That's what happened. So the price of electricity for customers went up, while the wholesale price went significantly down. And that's now the defining factor of the European energy sector, definitely in Central Europe, Germany, my country, others. Well, thank you. Our time is up. I think this thank was you. a remarkably <laughs> this was thank, remar thank, thank the you. panel. This has been a remarkably great panel. And and terrific questions by everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, sir, good luck. I need to have you come visit. <laughs>